Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Don't Mom Alone podcast. I'm your host, Heather McFadden, and this is the place where I get to walk alongside you and connect you with people and resources so you know that you don't mom alone. And in this episode, number 427, I've invited to the show my friend, Kristen Glass. That was God, like God orchestrated. And I could take that stage the very next day, knowing so clearly my purpose. I know I was put on this planet to make other women specifically feel not alone in their marriage struggles, in their codependency, in their anxiety, in their overspending, in their overeating, in their overdrinking. Today, my friend Kristen is going to share her story. And my question for you is, who do you call when it feels like your world is falling apart? Do you share your struggles with trusted friends or is it hard to open up about what's actually going on in your life? Towards the end of her first marriage, Kristen broke a habit she'd had for years, which was struggling silently. She was carrying shame for her actions and the circumstances that left her feeling condemned and isolated. All that changed one weekend when she finally found the courage to tell a friend her story. We hope that by Kristen sharing her story, that if you are in a place where you're not okay and something's going on, that that encourages you to do the same thing, to find a friend, to tell someone, because shame loves to live in the shadows. And it is through community that we break free and we find the hope and the healing that we need through people and through God. And so let's get right to my conversation with Kristen. Here we go. Kristen, Hi. welcome to the Don't Mom Alone podcast. Thank you. I am so excited to be here. So excited I mean, to be here with you. I have lots of different types of episodes. People know this. I'll sometimes have counselors on to give us some advice as parents. I'll have mentors on who've gone a step before me. And I also have a lot of friends who give testimony of what God's done in their life. And today is a testimony and also an invitation for people to not feel isolated in whatever they're walking through that's similar, to hear your story and to believe that God's for them in whatever they're walking through right now. So why don't we start off with a little introduction of you and your kiddos, where you are right now, and then we'll go back. I would love to. Um, So my name is Kristen Glass. Obviously, I am from Montgomery, Alabama originally, live here in Dallas now. We know each other because our my oldest, your second oldest, yep. mm-hmm. um, have been in class together for a while. And we did now our youngest are in class together and best buds. But Heather, like you, you came into my life and you've always been one of those people who I just trusted, you know, mm-hmm. with pretty much everything. Um, once I was ready to tell my story and our story is pretty complicated. And our story, though, I've realized I'm not alone in the, what's happened to us over the past five years. So as of now, um, I have two kids. Caroline is 15, Banks is 11, and awesome kids, greatest kids, my best friends. Um, I'm also married. I got married at Thanksgiving to my amazing husband, Chris, who we met when I was 41 years old. So Chris is my second husband, which is a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. I am a full-time health coach, and I go to speak to different groups about mental health, physical health, um, addiction, codependency, Al-Anon. And so I kind of have this brand new life that has really changed and morphed over the past five years because prior to this, I was a career artist. Everyone knew me as an artist. So God had a different plan for me that I had no idea was in the works. Yeah. And you're right where you belong. Yeah. Right now. Right where I belong. But the journey to get there, there's, you know, we all experience pain, different versions of pain. And for you, your story of pain, can you kind of take us back there to where your story, where you want to start in your story? Like I've told you, there's a lot I want to share today. Um, A lot I can't share today. Yeah. But I told you a couple of weeks ago and then reiterated again, I want to be the person that I needed when I was going through the darkness. And in the darkest place, which is kind of where I, I guess I'll start, I had been married since 2004. And there were, you know, all marriages have issues. We had some pretty big issues. We worked really, really hard on those. 
And there came a place where I knew I was at a bit of an impasse. Was I going to stay married? Was I not going to stay married? And the truth was, this was about 10 years ago, but I didn't know anyone who was divorced. I was raised in a super Christian family, super conservative family, no divorce in my family, wasn't aware, you know, of what that was going to look like. So what did I do? I squashed those thoughts. I squashed those, you know, should I, should I do this? Should I not? I went to more therapy. We went to more couples therapy. We did every program at church. And the next five or so years, there was a big decline to the point that the darkest space I can remember was sitting in my closet seven years ago. No one knew what was going on at home. Nobody, not my best friends, not my parents. No one knew what was going on at home because I was filled with shame. I was filled with self-worth issues. I was filled with fear, but I was in my closet one night crying. And that was my, my like war room. I had Bible verses all over the walls. It was my place that I could go and be alone. And I was in that closet one night and some really bad stuff had happened in my house that very day. And I was on the floor. I can still feel the tile underneath me. I was sobbing like those visceral sobs that you just, they have to come out and they come from your soul. Um, The kids were asleep. I had the shower turned on. I had the water faucets turned on because I didn't want my kids hearing me sob. And at that moment, I was questioning whether or not God existed Mm -hmm. for the first time in my life at 39 years old, because I couldn't figure out why the life we were living, he was allowing it to go on. And that's how I was looking at it at that time. So I was sitting in my closet bawling and I heard God speak. Now I've heard God speak to me audibly two or three times. And this time he said, Kristen, wait, yeah, wait. And your story is going to change lots of lives. Hmm. That was what I heard. And I thought to myself that night, how on this planet, Hmm. how in the world am I going to do that? I have massive anxiety disorder. My self-worth was in the toilet. We were in so much debt. I was a wreck, like just a wreck of a person. And you will remember this. I weighed about 70 pounds more than I weigh right now. I was drinking every single night. I didn't know how he was going to do that. But I listened And instead of waiting patiently, I did what us control freaks do. And I decided I was going to give God some suggestions. I was going to tell him how he could fix this, how we could fix this faster. I have control issues too. So I thought, well, that's great, God, but your timeline's not aligning with my timeline. So here's how I need you to fix it. And here's what I want this to look like. And I waited. I didn't have a choice. And I think me being so stubborn, he put a couple of more obstacles in our way um, to be like, hey, girl, remember, I'm in charge, not you. And I love to be in charge. So (laughs) that was seven years ago. And about two years after that, I kind of say the bottom fell out of our lives. I filed for divorce. I didn't have a career where I could support the kids yet. Um, I didn't totally know how this was going to look. The bottom fell out, but a new ceiling emerged. Hmm. And our life, when you don't have anything to fall back on, you really lean into God. You don't have any other choice. And the life we're living right now is so much better on the other side of it for all of us, my children, for me. Um, And I just want other women to know that they're not alone. If they're thinking about divorce, if they're going through a divorce, if they're suffering with something at home that they don't share with anybody, if they're massively codependent, if they're anxious, if they're overweight, like all of these things, I needed someone who had gone before me to say, Kristen, here's, it's going to be okay. And here are some tips and helpful ideas. And I mean, I just didn't have anything. So anyway, that was kind of the darkest place. And God didn't fix it. He didn't fix it how I wanted him to. He didn't fix it right away, but he fixed it better. He fixed it absolutely better. And I think I shared with you the other night, I have Ephesians 3.20 um, monogrammed into all of our bed sheets in our house. 
because he fixed it better than I could have even imagined. Tell the tell the people who don't have that memorized Ephesians three twenty. Well, and it's so funny because it's a great verse, but there's a certain word in there that that I really clue in on. Um, but three, Ephesians three twenty is now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his work or his power that is at work within us. Immeasurably more. Mm-hmm. That stands out to me. That's what you hear everyone say, though. Like you always hear Ephesians three twenty immeasurably more. So that's more than we had anticipated. But what the, what I really love in that verse is more than all we ask or imagine. Because what we don't realize is so often we cap our dreams, our request, what we can imagine, into what we know. Yeah. We don't think about what God knows. We know what's possible, what we've seen in our life, and that's the best that we can imagine. So we cap ourselves. But when you think about it, wow, my imagination, and I'm, you know, I'm a control freak, anxious person who um, is crazy empathetic. So I've got a pretty great imagination. And an artist. Yeah. And an artist too. Yeah. Like actually my imagination is partially my problem. That's why I overthink, <laughs> pro- that's why I overthink issues all the time. Um, you imagine some amazing scenarios oh, could happen. Yes. Yeah. I mm-hmm. have to have contingency plans for every possible thing. Yeah. Um, but if you compare my imagination and God's imagination, mm. that is enough hope to get you through a hard day. Yeah. Like God imagined creating a world if you think that that's the person who gets to imagine your future, that's pretty cool. That's it's pretty so cool. cool. It's so cool. All right, business owners, we all know that hiring is challenging. And yes, while we love challenges, we also would appreciate a hiring partner that helps us rise to that challenge. You need Indeed, because Indeed is the hiring platform where you attract, interview, and hire candidates all in one place. So instead of spending hours on lots of different job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed has a powerful hiring platform that helps you do everything. They streamline hiring with tools that help you find matched candidates. So with Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed data in the US. One of the things I do love about Indeed is it makes everything so much easier. Like I've said, maybe you didn't hear me when I said it before, but when you invite a candidate to apply for your job, you are three times more likely to see them apply than if they only search. It gets you so much closer to getting the people who are going to help make your business better. It's awesome because you only pay for applicants that meet what you write down as must have requirements. So you can join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And you can start hiring now with $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash DMA. This offer is good for a limited time, so make sure you claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash DMA. Just go to Indeed.com slash DMA and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash DMA. Terms and conditions apply. If you need a hire, then you need Indeed. Okay, so I know you're, you're at the tied up with a bow. Chris is amazing. We were just at a pool party with our littles and you and I are talking and you're standing up and he goes and gets you a chair. These are the small things. These are the small things that are the big things. The men who love you well. I do want to go back to you in the closet and the crying because that's where a mom is right now or a dad. Totally. Listening. Totally. Um, And you said he told you to wait you had plans for him. You said you didn't know anyone where divorce was an option. I'm a little bit curious about, you said you didn't tell anybody. I'm curious about what you were feeling and why you couldn't tell anybody because, and I know you said we can't tell details, but there was significant things going on that we always encourage women to talk to people about and to get safe. Yeah. So 
for some, and, and I know that this is true. Al Anon, you go to one Al Anon meeting. I know this is true. We keep going and we think things will change. Yeah. Or we, we put on the strong face, even though we don't feel strong inside, and we enable. Absolutely. So, or worse, we think we can change them. Right. Yes. We can make this better on our own. Intercodependency. Yes. <laughs> So tell me, yeah, talk through that a little bit so that the person listening can be like, oh, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. And I think that's important. So like almost important to kind of even give you some more of my background, because I think there is a subsect of women who are really similar to me. Um, I was raised in Montgomery, Alabama, like I said, in Alabama. Oh, I'm in Alabama. Yeah, we put our mm -hmm. kids in smock dresses. We mm -hmm. put a bow in their hair. Mm -hmm. We've got the kids in the John Johns, and we put a hashtag blessed post on every <laughs> single Facebook page. We could be going through absolute nightmare at home, but we're hashtag blessing that and putting our babies in those smock clothes and acting like everything is perfect. Mm -hmm. That's how we were raised. Yep. And I don't know where this all came from. Like, Southern Baptist Convention? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, and I've got my, yeah, yeah, basically. Um, mm -hmm. no, I'm, not, who, I'm not dogging on the Southern no, Baptist, but I do no. think there's an element of sin in your life means you're not a good Christian, so you can't say that you have sin and you need Jesus. I completely agree. And I've got one sect of my family that was Baptist and mm -hmm. one that's Episcopalian and you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> I but, grew up Baptist, so I think I can speak on it. Okay, yes, not Southern and being a Baptist, but yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was raised that way. And yeah. and then you realize so many other people were also raised that way. So what are we doing? We're sitting at home, looking at social media, at everybody else in their smock dresses, skipping down 30A, holding hands, hashtag <laughs> blessed signs, thinking, oh my gosh, well, that girl's life is perfect. Mm -hmm. And mine is crumbling. So why would I even share yeah. what's going on? Because they, they've got it all together. There's that part of it, which mm -hmm. I think we're all pretty aware of. And yeah. if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, that is my goal is to make people realize that is not the truth. Like I want to put it all out there. I want people to not feel alone. So there's that part of it. But then there's this other part when I don't know if it's self-imposed. I'm a firstborn girl, Enneagram three, really high achiever, went to a college, got the perfect job after college. I can handle anything. And I want people to think I can handle anything. So one of the fates worse than death to me is having to ask for help. Mm. I don't do that. Yeah. I don't want people to think I'm weak. I didn't want my parents to worry about me. How classic yeah. firstborn is that? I don't want my mom and dad to worry about me when I think I can probably handle it. Yep. So I didn't tell anyone. Hmm. Then you even go to this next part of that. And at the root of really all of these decisions is insecurity, massive insecurity, massive insecurity about myself as a mother, massive insecurity about myself as a wife and bring in my weight issues back then. So weighing 70 pounds more than I did, there was a lot of times that I would make these deductions that I'm a bad wife because I'm an ugly wife. I don't think I was ugly necessarily, but I, I viewed myself. No, I saw. I knew you then. You were beautiful. I, I you were funny. I mean, that's what You're I still thought. funny. You're still beautiful. Well, thank you. Well, thank but you. But it is the was, inner monologue we're telling totally, us. You could totally whatever size you are right now, you might be someone's goal weight. Whatever Absolutely. size you are. So it's not about a number, but it's about your state of mind in that body. Yeah. What are you believing about yourself? And you are believing, I am ugly and I'm a bad wife. I am yeah. worthless. I'm a yeah. bad mom. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you bring in some other dynamics that were happening inside of my home. And the only narrative I was hearing was this really dark one that was in my head. Yeah. And then another one that validated the darkness that was in my head. Yeah. An outside voice. Mm -hmm. An outside voice, but that was in my home. Yeah. So the only people who actually knew me were God, me, and one other person. God speaks truths. Like God was speaking truths. That that voice inside of my gut that was saying, this isn't right, Kristen, that mm. was God. But mm. the other two voices were louder. Yeah. That's what was going on. And But again, everyone's so surprised when I start telling the truth because you would have had no, no. idea. 
No, I will say as an outsider, because we would be at school things. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say that I'd be like, huh, what's wrong with that girl? I would say more, and you tell me if I'm wrong, that okay. it, you tried to be invisible. Yes. Like you didn't. Yes. You are a strong, powerful woman. Right. But I don't think that side of you was allowed out in the spaces where we shared space. No. It didn't seem like you were trying to like say, hey, people look at me or I've got yeah. ideas or Mm-mm. – So I wouldn't say like I thought less of you. I just was like, hey, there's Kristen, but I don't really know her. I don't really know who she is. And I don't know if that was you trying to hide or it was like there's so much going on. See, I think there was a lot of that. That it wasn't like you – had the space to do more than just be. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think I was that tired too. Like I was that tired. I don't, I look at that season of life and I know that somebody else is listening to this and going through this exact season of life where they can't rest Mm -hmm. ever. You are so codependent and you are so fixated on someone else's behavior not a child, because I think that's kind of a natural thing as mothers. And especially at the age my kids were then, you are somewhat fixated on the outcome of their behavior. But in other adults, when you are that codependent and your day revolves around someone else's who's an adult's decisions and whether or not you are going to have to fix things, it's exhausting. Yeah, it is exhausting. So I know I was tired. I do think I tried to hide because I didn't feel like who I was and who God created me to be was enough or was right. Yeah. And I'm, I don't fit the mold. I've never fit the mold. And we go to a really, I'm sorry, it makes me like emotional. Like don't apologize to, for emotions on the dumb. Right, podcast. We go to like such a very conservative school that is just a home, but I'm like, oops, I accidentally cussed. Oops. And my skirt's too short. Oops. You know, like, I don't totally fit that mold. And back then I wanted to try to fit that mold. And I get that. I knew I couldn't, so I just hid. Now I don't care. Now I'm like, here's who I am. This is who God made me to be. I'm secure in that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's exhausting and, and it's hard too when your kids are young and you know you feel like you're always at family events at school. And everybody, here comes the smock dresses that all match and everybody looks happy and every, you know, let's do a whole family thing and this and that. And it's a lot, like it's a lot when you're looking around thinking I'm the only person at this school in credit card debt. I had that narrative in my head. I'm the only person in this school who has to work the hours I work to pay some bills. Like I'm the only person in this school who has this upfront view of some really hard stuff. Yeah. Now, I've got an interesting story, though, about this time. It wasn't at the point where I ended up filing for divorce, but prior to that, someone at our school found out about some, some a secret I was hiding in a way that was not my choice, but they found out. And it broke me, broke mm. me, because this person was one of those people who I look, put on a pedestal as one of the people who have the perfect life. She was an older mom than me. Her kids were older. She just, she was one of those people. Well, it was one of the worst case scenarios that would happen. And one of those, if this ever happens, I will be mortified. Well, it happened. Mm -hmm. And she called me after this thing happened. We did not know each other, Heather, at all. She called me and she said, hey, I just want to tell you, we've struggled with this very thing inside Mm -hmm. our own family. Mm -hmm. And we've struggled with it for 10 years. She and I are really close now, Mm -hmm. and that conversation was all God, all Mm -hmm. God. The fact that it was that person, it was a very real reality in their life, and that, and you don't even know this, that opened up actually a door for us to start sharing with other wives and mothers at our Mm -hmm. school who've Mm -hmm. been struggling with something similar. Wow. And so we have a little group of us now. And that's the thing. Stop struggling silently. It's such the enemy's trick. Yeah. To keep us in shame. Yes. Yes. Enslaved in the shame and the hiding. And oh, what? I mean, that just, I have goosebumps. I'm just, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that you have not just one, but a group 
And and I'm thinking about how many couples actually ended up divorced in a year in that class. There, there's a few. And I was grieved at knowing that none of these marriages were in crisis because that's the community we had built was like a shh, don't ask, yeah. don't tell. And it made my heart sad. Yeah. Not not sad that, I mean, I like I told you, I have brothers, they're divorced. Divorce right. wasn't new to me. I, I don't have a shock and awe over that. But just like, a, man, I really don't intimately know the people that I'm doing life with. And I was sad. But we curated it that way. Yeah. Or, or mm-hmm. I know at least two of us did. Like we absolutely <laughs> created that. Yeah. And there are so many women who are listening to you who are doing that exact same thing right now. Yep. And are questioning their religion, questioning their um, place in their religion more so. Mm. If, if they're yeah. thinking about divorce, if they're going through divorce, like that is the hardest part to me. Yeah. Talk about that. Talk about the how the church responded because you did mention in, in passing that you went through some church directed marriage programs because some people be like, well, make sure you do couples counseling. Right. Absolutely. Make sure you do Al Anon. Absolutely. Make sure I mean you've done all these things, but I think there was some damage done. So talk through that because there someone was may have some maybe talk through that. So someone who's been damaged, it doesn't yeah. take um, God away. I'm glad you're saying that because I was like, do I say this or do I not? I think you do. Um, I'm a high achiever, so I don't just do things once. If it doesn't work, I'm going to do it twice, maybe three times. So we chose to go through a It's like a 12-step marriage marriage. program Mm -hmm. at a big popular church here in Dallas. Mm -hmm. Went through once, didn't work out so well. Um, Actually, the first time I felt so much shame I felt so much worse leaving those meetings. I felt like I was mm. the problem. Mm. I felt like if I could do, if I could be a better wife, if I could be a better mom, oh, if I could be a better Christian, mm. then I could fix this problem. So I would go home, do all my homework, you know, because there's all these things we had to do and then thought maybe I'll do his homework too. Because okay. that's, how, that's how we do. Um, mm-hmm. So, but I was exhausted. So we... Ended the first one, and I felt definitely, I don't know if worse is the right answer, but I thought, okay, I need to fix a whole lot more about me. The message you received was not, this is normal, and here's some help for you as a couple. It was, I'm the problem. Yeah. I need to put more energy towards solving this problem. Yeah, it was almost felt like a pass for some things that I think were impassable, you know? Mm. So we went through the first time, then went back the second time. Same exact thing. Same mm-hmm. exact thing. Same exact theme. I felt like it was very male driven and was putting wives into these little boxes of being the ones who needed to actually fix and protect the family. When I don't think that's the role that the wives need to be in. So I felt like it was all on my shoulders again. So that second time didn't work. Then we went a third or I signed, okay. I'm sorry, I signed up for a third, but we never actually attended because my therapist at that point said, Kristen, enough. But you hear this, this marriage and I, I know it's different at every church. So it was the church that we went to. I can confidently say it was not helpful for us, but you will hear of this marriage seminar at other churches and people have great experiences. This was yeah. just my experience. Totally. And, and when I've started voicing this more, especially to the women around Dallas who have gotten divorced or who are filing for divorce. I'm not alone in how I felt going through those different seminars. I'm not the only one who felt that way. And we actually left that church. So, um, cause I couldn't feel okay with my kids being there too. You didn't feel like the messaging from the leaders was get your family safe. Yeah. And I didn't feel heard. Mm hmm. Or seen. I, I know, actually, I know I wasn't seen. Hmm. I didn't feel heard. It's official. Our schedules are insane. And one mom hack that I have shared with you before, but maybe it hasn't resonated until now that your life is as crazy as mine, is HelloFresh. What I appreciate about HelloFresh is I'm getting farm fresh, pre portioned ingredients 
and seasonal recipes that are delivered right to my doorstep. Imagine you are going through your week and you know in your fridge you have three dinners already planned, all the ingredients you need for them, all ready to go. You just take that brown bag that they all come in, you dump it on the counter and you start cooking. What I appreciate is it's also affordable in that When I know what's for dinner and I have all the ingredients, I'm not buying extra things. I'm also not wasting food. I know that I have choices so I can go ahead of time and from their 40 different recipes, I can choose what I think my boys are going to like and they love the HelloFresh options. I also love that I can choose quick and easy recipes. I can choose 15 minute meals for those nights when I know I am going from one carpool to the next carpool. We have about an hour home before we head out to the next game that night. There's a lot going on during the week for us and HelloFresh makes my life so much simpler. I also know that it keeps our family value of wanting to have dinners together around the table and not spend a lot of money on fast food. In this season, if you want to get help on taking the stress out of mealtime with fresh ingredients that come to your door seven days from when they were in the farm, please check out HelloFresh. You go to hellofresh.com slash 550 the number DMA, use the code 50 DMA and you'll get 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. Y'all, did you catch that? Something a little different this time. Go to hellofresh.com slash 50, the number 50 comes first, then DMA and use the code 50 DMA for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. I think y'all will agree with me that HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. So my question next is, we've talked through like what you were feeling and the lies you were believing. What led you for the switch to overcome, to like finally say enough is enough? You had that older person who'd gone through similar things. Okay, so there's light getting shined on the dark places a little bit, what moved you to that next direction? This is so interesting. And when you mentioned about Chris pulling up my chair Mm -hmm. the other night at the pool party, that actually equates to something that was, there was two parts, two little catalysts to, and, and both. And I'm not saying I, so I filed for divorce and my husband was completely on board. So like it was a, we were both done. That was not a, you know, um, so there were some really severe, you know how you hit, you have those things in your head and, or I did. And I thought, if this ever happens to me, I'm leaving. If this ever happens to me, I would never stay married if this happened. Well, those things happened. And I absolutely stayed married because I, I did believe that God could repair things. And I thought maybe he's, that was my prayer. That was my prayer that God was going to repair and that our family was going to look different on the other side of all of this. And you'd be one of those amazing couples, which I've yes. interviewed of like yes. God redeemed Absolutely. and restored the marriage. And that does happen. So if you're listening, you're like, well, God do that maybe for your story, but you yeah. have to walk with God individually. Well, and that's what I wanted. Like that was the plan, you know, mm-hmm. the least disruptive. You're like, God, this is uh, my plan. Yes. Yeah. Like you said, the control. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, this is how my kids are going to be the healthiest. This is how mm-hmm. they're going to, you know, this is going to be the best thing for the kids. And yeah. So, so that was my plan. So two things happened. About two weeks before I filed for divorce, I went to a business conference in Utah and I went by myself to this business conference and I had rented my own little cabin because I am a complete introvert with massive anxiety disorder. So the last thing I want to do is stay in a room with other people. You know how these people travel together in groups (laughs) don't ever ask me to travel with you. I have no interest in traveling with other people or sharing Sharing a a bathroom. No. No. Okay. Zero. So controlling anxious Kristen rents her own cabin. So I go up to this place in Utah, it's Sundance and it's magical. Mm-hmm. Get to my cabin and I'm like, hmm, this is very remote. And you know me well enough, Heather, to know that I am not a wilderness girl. Like not, I, I really looked at this cabin and I call it the murder cabin, this place they took <laughs> me to to check in. And I was like, this is not at all what I was anticipating. And a couple, two couples had said earlier, hey, Kristen, we'd love for you to come stay with us. And there are two of those people, those couples that you really look up to. They are some of my spiritual mentors. They're some of my best friends. Like they're just those great people. But I said, no. 
So I'm in this cabin after I checked in and I'm thinking, God, why did I do this? I should have stayed with my friends. And all of a sudden a rat runs across the floor of my cabin, oh my which I was like, that's, there you go. God, I'm, I'm listening this time. So I picked up my stuff, called my friends and I said, can I come stay with y'all for this conference at your house? So I checked, so I went in with them and stayed with them. And one of the girls, Joanna Mitchell, who is just one of these incredible people who I also had put on a pedestal, put her marriage on a pedestal, put her faith on a pedestal, put as how she is as a mom on a pedestal. Like she's just one of those people. We woke up early one morning and she and I were having coffee. And for some reason, I felt the Holy Spirit say, Kristen, tell her everything. Mm-hmm. Tell her everything. And Joanna was not one of my closest friends at the time. She was a good friend, but not a close friend. I told her everything. Mm-hmm. We're sitting in this living room, like tears coming down. She's this little tiny thing. She grabbed me by the shoulders and she said, Kristen, God did not intend for you to live this way. Yeah. You are a child of God. You are worthy. You are beautiful. You are smart. God did not intend for you to live this way. And it was her saying that, that I was like, huh. So then her husband, Jay, comes into the room and Jay is just, he's got like the, such a servant's heart. So Jay sees how this conversation, Joanna and I are just like engrossed in. He says, girls, do you want some coffee? And we said, yes. And I watched Jay take our coffee cups and go heat them in the microwave and then pour coffee into them. And I said, well, why did you do that? And he said, I want y'all to be able to sit and talk as long as possible. So I wanted the coffee cup to be super warm for you. And I get chills still saying that. And I, I, that, that moment where he was literally serving Joanna and me, I thought, this is how men can act. Like, this is what God created it for us to be in a partnership is to help each other. And it was that little thing that Jay did that just, it stuck with me. And I came back from that trip and about a week and a half later, a little small something happened. And um, it was very small if you're looking on paper, but I knew it was my sign to file for divorce. And I very calmly called my attorney, said, I'm ready to file for divorce, called my dad and said, Hey, can, um, I'm going to go on and file for divorce and I'll be honest here. Cause I want somebody else to hear this too. Yeah. yeah. I asked my dad if I could borrow $20,000 because I didn't have any money. Yeah. So at 41 years old or 40 years old, I had to ask my dad for money because I didn't have any, I spent way too much money on credit cards. I overspent at stupid things, target home goods, wherever I had to like, just humble myself and say, dad, I need this money. And he gave it to me or loaned it to me. But what was also interesting that night, Heather, and you don't even know this after I filed for divorce that night, 30 minutes later, I got a phone call from the head of our corporation to do a speaking engagement the very next day in Phoenix in front of 6,000 people. So 30 minutes, I filed for divorce, get a phone call. And I was like, there we go. Like God, and I wanted to say no, but I said yes. And that was God, like God orchestrated. And I could take that stage the very next day, knowing so clearly my purpose. I know I was put on this planet to make other women specifically feel not alone in their marriage struggles, in their codependency, in their anxiety, in their overspending, in their overeating, in their overdrinking. I just, it was that, that day. So that was the, really the like fulcrum point in all of this. I had goosebumps. I mean, I've had so many goosebumps. Y'all, we should just label this goosebump episode. People will be very confused. They'll think it's the book series. Um, I am so thankful for you. I'm thankful for you being brave and sharing your story. I'm thankful for you being honest in parts that I know are hard to be honest about, but you've overcome. And so you're like, they don't hold me back. I would love in the last little bit that we have of time, if you could kind of help, I know for you, it was sitting down with someone and getting honest. That was the impetus to move forward and to do the thing that you felt God telling you to do. How can you help someone who's listening take that step, whatever direction it is on whatever thing, whether it's codependency, whether it's their anxiety, whatever help they need the next step and they've been stuck Well, and if it, there's something I just feel like on my heart that I really do want to say right now regarding divorce and feeling stuck 
if you're in that place in your marriage and someone said to me like that purgatory place Mm. before you file for divorce is the worst and they're right that am I going to file? Am I not going to file? That is the worst part of the entire divorce. I will confidently say that all day long, that wishy-washy. And then like, like we said with the creative brain, my brain went into all these places. Yeah. All these what if places. I had this crazy vision, Heather, that I was going to be in front of a courtroom, like on Judge Judy or something. That's not really how it works. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I had, I've never broken a law, so I don't really know a lot about this stuff. Yeah. So in my head, I thought I was going to be in front of this courtroom and that they were going to find some crime I had committed like while I was mm-hmm. asleep in like 1998 or something. I don't know. But that's where your brain goes to, that, I, that some judge was going to say, you're an unfit mother. I'm going to take your kids away from you. Like I am perfect on paper as a mom and you know, I've got a billion flaws, but like, you know, I made this situation up. I was so scared and my control was so, my control issues were so heightened that I had all of these terrible scenarios, terrible in my head. I also had a lot of fear and this is going to sound really crazy to someone who might not have gone through divorce, What we believe is it's going to be crazy, but you say it and we're like, nope, that doesn't sound crazy. Yeah. So I was so tired that I had so much fear over the amount of paperwork, Hmm. like overwhelmingly fearful of what kind of like hassle almost this would be. The Hmm. logistics kept me so stuck because I was so exhausted. And so my advice to anyone who's in a situation that they feel like this might be the next step for their family, meet with an attorney and have Mm -hmm. a consultation. It took my anxiety level down from like 200% to like 80%, which is still high for most people, but I could handle it. So having that meeting where I understood what the process was, because I wasn't from a family who knew that process, that changed everything for me to understand what those logistics were going to look like and were not going to look like. Um, because those two things kept me really, really stuck. Um, yeah. and I, and if you think about it, it's all in your head. I was yeah. stuck because of a figment of my imagination, which isn't that how we, so many of us are. Mm-hmm. We're constantly imagine scenarios. stuck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Imagine scenarios. Absolutely. And I think there's a fear of, you've mentioned of loss, not just of the marriage, but loss of relationships that are tied to the marriage, yeah. loss of you, you imagine that you will be isolated because now you're in a different category. I, I, I am imagining that, that that would be true if someone's walking through this decision. What kind of other fears were related beyond the paperwork or just the overwhelm or having well, there's, never seen there's it? There's always fears about your kids. I mean, that's the mm-hmm. biggest thing. Yeah. Like, am I yeah. going to be screwing up my kids? I mean, that yeah. really is the number one thing that you worry about is, am I going to be screwing up my kids? But have they been screwed up? They are doing so well. I mean, it's like yeah. this has God all over. It. We are they are so stable, so solid, so secure because their mom is. Mm. They were feeding off of that energy and I see I see families who are in that purgatory place and I see their kids and I tell the mamas all the time, "Please like make a decision." Because mm. it's hard for those kids not to have their home, which is their place for respite, to be peaceful. Mm. That it's so much better to have two peaceful homes than one home that is in disarray. That is not fair. Talk a little bit. I know you've got a child to take care of. No, I'm good. Today. I'm good. Um, I'm good. Talk a little bit though about even the fears now that do you have any shared custody or you have 100% custody? No, is there we fear have about shared custody. Okay. Like I know that that's a thing. I have one of my brothers have gone through and just if the other person isn't healthy and the reason that the marriage ended, the fear of then your children being in the presence of that person when you're not there. So that is a huge fear. And in our such case, that was the biggest concern and still is the biggest concern. This is where if any of your viewers are dealing with something like that, I would love for them to even message me directly because we've been in court a lot, a -hmm. lot to get safeguards in place. And I'm very confident now in safeguards to make sure my kids still have a fabulous relationship with their dad, but also are safe all the time. It's also exposed. I had a client earlier today. There's some, there's some stuff that goes on um, in different communities, recovery communities, where 
there's ways to get around some of the court things and um, that's scary, but I'm pretty versed in it now. And I do like if, if anybody's going through a divorce and there's concerns over that, I want to be able to share with them. Um, but that was but a it's tricky to share fear. too much yeah. on a public it's podcast, tr- but it's so tricky. It's so tricky. Yeah. You're in a hard, it's, you're in a hard position, but I think that it's a reality that that could be the thing that keeps someone. Oh, it, oh my gosh, Heather, step. it kept me there for a long, long time. And our therapist, the, the kids therapist, she actually really encouraged me to celebrate, encourage both my, me and my ex-husband to celebrate the differences in our home. Mm-hmm. Like I'm the boring mom, you know, I'm the <laughs> so boring, boring, the boring structured boring. mom that, you know, we eat healthy and we have bedtimes and all that. And dads typically are just more fun, you know? So our therapist really said, like, you have your world here at your mom's, you have your world here at your dad's, celebrate that and l- let the kids know, like, mom's world's not going to look like dad's world. Dad's world's not going to look like mom's world. And there's great things about both of them. And and the kids then have a real clear understanding of which house they're at, which rules are in place, which boundaries are there, and they feel healthy and, and safe and structured and secure. Okay. Okay, well, I do want to, I think one last question is for someone who's walking alongside a friend who's in that purgatory place, what was the most helpful thing that someone said to you? Oh my gosh. So I'm sure there's lots of hurtful things, but what's like helpful? You know, it's funny. I haven't had a whole lot of hurtful things, but I'm also super conditioned to ignore people. I think Um, (laughs) if if you know me, like if you don't like me, I'm not one of your people. Cool. Like, let's just go, you know, I I, I have 0% concern about what people think of me anymore. Zero. Like God leveled me in yeah. all the ways. So now if you don't like who I am, like we, that is just fine. We don't yep. need to be on mm-hmm. the same, on the same boat. So great. That's what was great. helpful. What was um, helpful? Yes. But a friend said to me during, after I had started to open up about things that were going on and I would open up to people and their jaws would drop yeah. all the time. And that felt kind of crappy too, mm. because it made me feel stupid. It mm. made me feel like, gosh, I really, I, there's the should word. I should have done this. I should have done that. And I felt really stupid. I had this one friend say to me, Kristen, nobody knows what you're really go, what's really going on at home. No one knows what's really going on in your life. Nobody can put a timeline on you. You and God are the only ones in charge of the timeline. It's because I had, at, at some point, I had a lot of friends saying, you need to file now. You need to file now. You need to file now constantly. Mm. And I felt, I I felt stupid and that's a big fear of mine. Mm -hmm. The next time I'd see them, I'd feel stupid because nothing had changed. And she said, your timeline is your own timeline. You need, you will know when the right time is. And it was that clear, but I had to ask myself a lot. Am I suffering in reality right now? Or am I suffering in imagination? Mm -hmm. And there was so much suffering that was created in the imaginary imagination yeah. At that point yeah. that once I would say, am I really suffering in reality and like come down to truths, like hard facts, it made it a whole lot easier um, because I did. I postponed a lot because of my imagination and control issues and anxiety and fears. And really one of the sins I know that I um, am guilty of is making my children an idol. Mm-hmm. And it's the thing I struggle the most with now. Still, I make those kids an idol and think they're my kids when they're not. Yeah. They're God's kids. And it's hard if you are, you know, in a place where it's you and your kids and you're in this marriage wonkiness, it's a lot easier to make them an idol in that situation when you don't have that partner to kind of take some of that attention and focus and obsession. I think even with the partner, I recently, yeah. I mean, I told you, I did my psychodrama, got yeah. myself all. <laughs> Psychodramas, like I told you, the worst branding, but like the experiential, and I had to cut it off. Like they can't be the place where I get my identity and worth. I say it out loud, but I needed like a supernatural cinching of it that God alone is the one who gets to tell me my value and worth. My marriage doesn't. My friends don't. My career doesn't. My kids definitely don't. Yeah. Yeah. Heather, there's one last thing I want to say, and I I was a little bit hesitant to say it, but I just want to say it. On the other side of filing for divorce, and yes, it it is logistically, it's not the most fun thing to go through a divorce, okay? That's great. On the other side of it, though, I found myself again, 
Mm. And I, I know this version of me. I knew this version of me back when I was like 22, 23. On the other side of not being obsessed with someone else or like having that constant tension in your home, I learned I love coffee. I didn't know I loved coffee because I was so uber focused on everybody else's needs. I felt like the sky was more blue. I felt like the grass was more green. And it's like I almost lost myself for about 18 years. This is who I was born to be. This is who I am. And on the other side of it, it's just this piece that I didn't realize was even possible again. And so that's not to glamorize divorce. That is not at all to glamorize divorce. But some of those fears that you're obsessed with, they're there. But the reality on the other side is just a beautiful life. Like it really is so much better than I could have possibly imagined. And God did give me the marriage I prayed for. He did give me the best friend. He did give me what so Chris is such my protector. I sleep at night. Um, physically, obviously, Chris looks like my protector, but like mentally and emotionally, he gave me the thing I was praying for. It just was in a different way. It was in yeah. his way. And it's so much better. Release those plans. Surrender. I know. Thank you, Kristen. You're I will welcome. get all your contacts and put them in the show notes so people can connect with you. And especially if someone is walking through this and needs a little more attention and time. So I appreciate I you so much. All right. So I love much. You. And I'll Thanks. see you on the sideline somewhere, yes. I'm sure, or in the carpool. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thanks, y'all, for joining us. I wanted to make sure you knew that I put Kristen's email in the show notes. So if you want to reach out to her personally, you were impacted by her story or um, just you need encouragement from her, she's willing to connect with you that way. I'm going to pray for us. Uh, Lord, I thank you that not only do you promise to be our ever-present help, that you are a comforter, that we can know you are so networked, but you also do give us in-flesh people to walk through life with. I pray against any false beliefs that are keeping people isolated, that they feel like they're too far, that they're too broken, that their situation is too hard, that they fear being rejected for what the truth of their story. And I pray that we would be people who would love others well, that we wouldn't talk badly about others behind their back or speak ill of people and meet each other at the foot of the cross, Lord. I pray that we would be those people, the most gracious people, loving and kind and accepting and warm who encourage and build up and point people back to you, God, in the hope that is only found in you. I pray for Kristen and her family, and I pray for continued guidance and healing and comfort for all of us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Thanks y'all for joining me. We'll be back in the text series next Monday. And thanks for always sharing with your friends. Such an encouragement to me. All right. See you back here next week. Adios. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Don't Mom Alone podcast. If you're wanting to connect with more people and more resources to help remind you that you're not alone, head over to don'tmomalone.com. That's where you'll also find show notes with any links mentioned by our guests. Most importantly, I want you to know the good news, the great news that you're not alone because God has promised to always be with you. With faith in Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and rose again, Jesus said when he left, he was going to leave a helper, a comforter to be with us. God in us. Moms, that's superpower. So while you're washing dishes at your kitchen sink, while you're driving to and from work, while you're feeding that baby late into the night, while you're cleaning sticky floors, God promises to be just as present with you as when you're worshiping in a church pew. As it says in Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. Now that's good news. Have a great day.